Hello, welcome back to 40 Days with the Fathers. Today we're on day 33, carried on with Cyril of Jerusalem's catechetical lectures. This is lecture 22, and the second to last one of his series. So today's lecture on the mysteries by Cyril is on the body and blood of Christ. And there's an, ex an exposition based on 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 25, which says... For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the cup of the new uh, covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So this whole lecture is about the Eucharist, and it goes into some details about what happens spiritually during it, which will probably offend certain Protestant ears, or low church, evangelical, Baptist, Protestants, rather than Reformed, I guess. Um, Cyril explains how this bread and this wine are no longer merely just bread or wine any longer, despite appearances. It seems as though some doubted this, or perhaps were a little sceptical, because Cyril goes on to explain that since Jesus himself declared the bread to be his body and the wine to be his blood, who shall dare to doubt any longer? Who shall ever he hesitate, saying that it is not his blood, he says. This view was not uncommon amongst the early church writers, and even today in certain branches and denominations there exists this belief, either in the form of transubstantiation, which is generally a Roman Catholic belief, which means that the bread and wine actually become literal body and blood at the consecration of the priest, even though the accidents was in the physical bread and wine itself still look like that. It's not that, as far as I understand it. Or of the real presence which sometimes transubstantiation is called the real presence, but in this sense I'm defining it separately, as in a doctrine of um, Anglicans, Lutherans, maybe Methodists, I'm not quite sure, and other sort of high church Protestants, and it usually means that Jesus is spiritually present in the elements in some real sense, but not necessarily in a physical sense, as in the bread changes. It's Jesus, sort of, I could use a Lutheran expression, it's the presence of Jesus is in, with and under the elements of the bread and the wine. <clears throat> but either way, the other church you was completely against it being purely symbolic and nothing more. It was always a spiritual element to it in some real way and some very, in a very uh, holy, special way. It wasn't such a flippant memorialist view, not to say that they're flippant, but you know, in a, it wasn't just bread and wine or juice or whatever you use. And it was actually the presence of Christ in it, in some real sense. Anyway, Cyril argues against the doubt by referencing the wedding at Cana and how Jesus turned water into wine by asking, is it incredible that he should have turned wine into blood? So then, with full assurance that something miraculous takes place during the Eucharist, let us partake of this most holy meal, for in the figure of the bread is given to you his body, and in the figure his of wine his blood so that we may also become the same body and the same blood with him since what we eat is then distributed throughout our own bodies Cyril points to Peter's words and states that it is a way in which we become participants of the divine nature which um, Peter says in 2 Peter 1 verse 4 and we become participants in that through eating the body and blood Emphasising the spiritual nature behind the bread and wine, Cyril then points to the time when Jesus argued with the Jews over his statement 
that they would need to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood if they were to have eternal life in them, and how they missed the point of Jesus' words and were offended, having not heard his saying in a spiritual sense. Uh, that's the whole discourse in John 6, if you want to look that up. This bread was also prefigured in the Old Testament, called the showbread, or the bread of the presence, which has now come to an end in Christ, who is the bread of heaven, broken for us so that we may have true life. And that showbread is, you can look that up in Exodus 35, verse 13, or chapter 39, verse 35, if you want to look at that. So spiritual presence, not physical. Quoting from David in Psalm 23, verse 5, when he says that the Lord prepares a table before him in the presence of his enemies, Cyril interprets this in light of the Eucharist as meaning that before Christ came, the table was one of demons, polluted with idols and defiled by the nature. But since Jesus, that table which God has prepared is that mystical and spiritual table, which is now contrary and in opposition to the evil one. Before you communed with demons, but now with God. Now the spiritual table is where we eat and commune with God, and though it may look like simple bread and wine, we take it on faith that it is more. And to quote Cyril, Consider therefore the bread and wine not as bare elements, for they are, according to the Lord's declaration, the body and blood of Christ. For even though sense suggests to you, let faith establish you. Judge not the matter from the taste, from the faith be fully assured without misgiving that the body and blood of Christ has been vouchsafed, given to you. Cyril then points to Solomon, saying he hinted at this grace found in the Eucharist in Ecclesiastes 9 verses 7 to 8, where it says, Go, eat your bread with enjoyment, let your garments always be white. Receive the joy that Christ gives and press on towards salvation. For now that you've put off the old garment, and are clothed with a garment that is now, which is always spiritually white. Cyril so closes off his lecture by saying that now his new converts have learned these things. They should be fully assured that seeming bread is not bread, though sensible to taste, but the body of Christ. And that the seeming wine is not wine, though the taste will have it so, but the blood of Christ. Before I began writing this book and studying the Church Fathers more, I held to a more symbolic view of the Eucharist or communion and just thought of it as it's just bread and wine. We remember Jesus as we take it, but there's nothing really more to it. It's just something that edifies our own personal faith individually. But the more I studied the scriptures alongside the Church Fathers, it led me away from the doctrine that communion is purely symbolic and towards the real presence idea that Christ is you know, actually spiritually present in the elements. In many ways I've always leaned that way in some form, but I didn't really know how to verbalise it or know what to call it until I read more church history. Because to me personally this view makes most sense, especially when you consider the seriousness of eating the Eucharist, which Paul writes about, to the Corinthian church. Otherwise, why would there be such dire consequences if there was nothing more to it than just a mere symbol? And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 30. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't think you would get sick and die and have judgment cast on you by God for misappropriating a symbol or having wrong motives or maybe sin in your life or something against another person in the church while you eat something that's just bread and wine or juice. If there was nothing more to it in a more real and spiritual sense. So from this view and the early church interpretation, it's made me, made me reconsider my views to be more of the real presence because if Christ is not really there, 
in a real sense, however that is, why would partaking in it in the wrong manner have any consequences on us to the point of being sick and dying? So it's definitely worth something considering and praying on if you've never heard this view before, especially since this was the position of the church for hundreds, about one and a half thousand years before memorialism came along during the Reformation. I know it's um, mainly through the teachings of Zwingli. He held to a more memorialist view, which is where it's, it sort of has its roots today in more Baptist churches and things. Though I think reading Zwingli himself, he's probably not quite as strict on it as modern churches are. But, um, is worth looking into though because there's the doctrine of real presence still exists in like like I said Lutherans Anglicans possibly Methodists and in a different sense in the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodoxy there's been a long history of it unbroken of a very fairly consistent teaching on it up until the 16th century when the Reformation took place which is when things changed a little there. So with this in view in mind, it's definitely changed my approach and thinking towards the bread and wine when I'm at church and giving the whole process a lot more meaning and weight to it when I when I take communion. And I, I pray that you will be also impacted by Christ's presence and the reality each time you partake in the divine mystery of the Eucharist. Amen. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed, enjoyed this one today. It's definitely a challenging one, I think, and something that if it, even if it grates against you and what you believe and think, it's something worth checking out and looking into if you have any interest in the early church and why they did and said these things and taught these things and very consistently from the earliest records we have up until very frequently in history, relatively speaking. So yeah, the uh, book's available online if you want to buy it, or you can just like and subscribe my video. There's links below for all the relevant things you can look up on social media. Uh, thanks, see you tomorrow.